Welcome back again, Advanced Vita Volunteers. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about uh, capital gains and loss kinds of income. And we had some brief introduction to some of these ideas in our last lesson where we were talking about uh, the exclusion of canceled debt on a principal residence. Uh, remember, in the case of a foreclosure or abandonment, um, that those transactions are treated like the sale of the home. So um, here again, we're going to be working with um, an asset that is owned by the taxpayer and they had sold during the year and then we need to figure out whether they sold it for a gain or whether they sold it for a loss. For the purposes of VITA, we are only going to be dealing with three types of assets, um, and those could be stocks or mutual funds or a personal residence. In the areas that we're going to be looking for on the form uh, 13614C, our intake form, are under that income section, question nine uh, asks if there was income or a loss uh, from the sale or exchange of stocks, bonds, virtual currency, or real estate, uh, including your home. And um, these clients might come in with informational forms 1099S or 1099B. Um, and then under life events, um, it's important to note there's a question under there, question eight says, um, did the taxpayer file a federal return last year containing a capital loss carryover on Form 1040 Schedule D? So we're gonna talk a little bit about those capital loss carryovers uh, in some slides down, down the way um, and what that means for uh, this return, what it might mean for future returns and why we need the previous return. So just as we were introduced in uh, that last lesson to the idea of calculating a taxable gain and loss, um, here again is that formula. We have the proceeds from the sale, um, or you know we could extrapolate that to the sales price um, minus the adjusted basis. Remember, basis is the cost, and then there are some things that happen over time to that cost that could add to it or subtract from it. Um, but we take the, the um, proceeds, we subtract that adjusted basis, and that determines whether we have a gain or loss. If that amount is positive, we have a gain. If the amount is negative, we have a loss. And we'll begin by talking about um, stocks and mutual funds. And when the taxpayer sells either a stock or a mutual fund, um, they will be getting a 1099B, uh, which will report the proceeds from that sale, uh, among other information. Now that last form was uh, the form that you get when you uh, go look up on the IRS website, their 1099B. But it's important to note that uh, frankly, most 1099Bs do not look like that. They look more like this form here, and they um, are attached to uh, what's called a consolidated 1099 statement. And these are the kinds of uh, statements that brokerage form firms uh, give their clients at the end of the tax year, um, or it's usually on more towards uh, February and March that taxpayers are receiving these. Um, and they are many pages long. Um, and usually this 1099B, you have to turn a couple pages to get there. Um, but this is um, what the 1099B would look like in, in a brokerage statement. Um, and you can see that um, there are columns and rows uh, the columns usually have, you know, a number that corresponds to a box, um, which will correspond to an input field for a tax layer. Um, so, yeah, just knowing what that looks like is, is kind of helpful, I think. So along with proceeds, um, there's going to be a cost or other basis reported on this form. Um, 
sometimes that is the basis that we take and sometimes there needs to be some adjustments to that. Uh, sometimes that uh, cost or basis has already been reported to the IRS and sometimes it has not. And that will change uh, in some ways the, the entries that we will be making. And here again is what uh, that looks like on a uh, brokerage statement 1099B. You can see there uh, that next column over from proceeds is for the cost or other basis. As I mentioned before, uh, sometimes there are adjustments to basis. So some things that could cause an adjustment to basis are when uh, gross proceeds are reported on the Form 1099-B as opposed to net proceeds. Um, and those are like the broker's commissions or fees. Um, typically, the broker will report net proceeds and take those out um, before reporting it to the taxpayer. But if they did not and they are reporting gross proceeds, which again, um, you will see either a checkbox on the IRS uh, form 1099B or it usually says there somewhere up at the top that they're reporting gross proceeds on the brokerage statement 1099Bs. Um, if that's the case, then uh, there will be a basis adjustment uh, and our taxpayers need to have kept records of these uh, fees that they paid, commissions and fees. Um, it's important also to note that um, we don't ever adjust the proceeds or the selling price. Um, this comes in as a basis adjustment. It, adju it adjusts the cost. Um, so we're never fiddling around with what we enter, what's reported and what we enter uh, as the sale price or the proceeds. It, the adjustment always comes in at the basis uh, side of things. So some other things that can affect the basis could be stock dividends or stock splits or uh, dividend reinvestment plans. And um, another important thing to note is that if our taxpayers um, maybe haven't been keeping such great records um, and they don't know their basis, we need to send them to a professional tax uh, preparer. And um, if there is no basis information uh, reported at all, then the IRS assumes that the basis is zero, that that cost was zero. So that means that the taxpayers would be paying tax on the whole sale price instead of this uh, sales price minus their cost. So you can see that um, that sort of a situation would not be favorable to them um, for for what they report on their taxes. So um, it's a more complicated situation when that happens. If they are unable to obtain their basis, uh, again, we just send them to a paid preparer to handle that situation. And there's really a whole list of um, types of things that can cause a basis adjustment. Um, there's a, a chart in um, publication 4012 on page D27 that covers the kinds of basis adjustments that there are and um, how to enter them into uh, tax layer and what the code on the form 8949, which we'll look at in a little bit here, uh, what that should be. So if you're in a situation where you think that there might be an adjustment to that cost, that basis, um, certainly be utilizing that publication 4012 um, these kinds of returns are not your quick returns. Um, you will expect to spend a little bit more time on, on them. Um, and, and it's good to let the taxpayer know. Um, they probably already know if they've been um, investing for a while that their returns just take a little bit longer. Um, but you wanna be sure to go slow and be looking things up as you go so that you get um, everything reported correctly. Sometimes the basis is something other than cost, and that can happen with inheritance, gifts, or in the case of a wash sale. Uh, with uh, inheritance, typically speaking, uh, the 
the basis will be the fair market value on the date of the decedent's death. So whomever our taxpayer inherited this property from, um, it's the date of that death, um, the, the value on the date of that death that will be the basis. Uh, sometimes there has been an alternate valuation that was elected by the state as the pro property was passing from uh, whoever it was that passed away to the taxpayer. Um, and so it's important for our, our taxpayers to have their records with them um, so that we, we know what the basis will be. And then for 2010, for reasons, um, the, the basis will be determined in other ways. And so uh, we aren't going to worry about 2010 property that has a basis that uh, from 2010, um, we're gonna send those taxpayers on to a paid professional. And then for gifts, uh, it's a fairly complex rules on how that basis is determined. It could be the adjusted basis of the donor or it could be the fair market value at the time the gift was made. Um, and because of the complexity of those rules, uh, gifts are the sale of a, a gifted property is going to be out of scope for our program. And then for wash sales, um, wash sales occur when uh, the, the taxpayer sold a piece of property at a loss and uh, within 30 days, either before or after, they bought a, another piece of property that was pretty much uh, similar or, um, or the same uh, property. So, you know, if somebody sold a certain uh, company's stock at a loss and then repurchased it the next day, uh, the IRS says it's, it's not going to recognize that loss right away. Um, and they call that a wash sale. So in the case of a wash sale, uh, that the purchase of the new, um, the new uh, stock, it, its basis is the cost plus the disallowed loss. And what that does is it just sort of pushes off the loss um, down, down the road until that taxpayer uh, sells that property um, for, for good, essentially. Another thing that we need to talk about with uh, regard to the sale of assets uh, is holding period. So the holding period is how long did the taxpayer own this piece of property or asset? Um, and so there is short-term uh, property and long-term property. So short-term property was held by the taxpayer for less than a year, and that is taxed at the taxpayer's ordinary tax rate. So it's the same tax rate as they would be paying for wages or unemployment income or um, any other kinds of earned income or um, many kinds of unearned income. Uh, Long-term property, so property that was held for more than a year, uh, is taxed generally at a lower capital gains rate. So um, this is really important to note the holding period and make sure that we are entering it appropriately in the return um, because it makes a difference in how, um, how our taxpayers are going to be taxed for the sale of this property. Looking again at the 1099B, the one that's included on the consolidated 1099s, uh, you can see up at the top there, it's, it says that this particular table is for short-term transactions. And uh, you'll notice that there's a column for the date acquired and the date disposed. Um, and each kind of um, property, uh, or holding period will be reported in a separate table. Um, so if this taxpayer had also long-term transactions, usually um, on the page below or, or somewhere underneath here, there would be uh, a table with long-term transactions. And it would look really similar to this. It, it's just up there at the top, it would say long-term transactions. And then I wanted to uh, make a note for you that um, 
Some of our taxpayers are quite busy with the sales of their stock, and that can result in um, you know, a long list of, of stock that was sold. Um, and in that case, we are allowed to do some, uh, you know, summary kind of reporting. Um, but it is still important to make sure that we're making some good categories because, again, that short term uh, property, those gains on the short term property sales are going to be taxed at the ordinary rate, whereas the gains on the um, property that was sold, uh, long term property that was sold, uh, should be taxed at a lower rate. So uh, we're going to categorize before we do any, uh, any lumping together uh, into a short term uh, property where the basis was reported uh, to the IRS, short term property where the basis was not reported. Then we'll also have some categories of long term where the basis was reported and uh, long term where the basis was not reported. Most often our taxpayers will um, end up with two categories. Um, usually the basis has been reported. So usually you'll have a short term basis uh, reported and a long term basis reported uh, block together. Um, so once you've uh, made sure that you're only blocking uh, those categories that go together, then you can enter that category total. And um, typically this just follows what's reported on the on the 1099 each table will have uh, summary totals and you take those. Um, just make sure that you're not adding together your short term and your long term. Um, and then if there was a basis adjustment to any of these uh, sales, you would check the box for the basis adjustment uh, for the category where that particular transaction uh, was, was uh, included. And then um, if it was a situation where the basis was not reported, uh, we would need to be attaching some documentation uh, which could be uh, scanned or we could um, send our um, taxpayers off with a, a printed out uh, 8949 um, and, and the documentation for the, the basis with that. So I know I keep referring to Form 8949 and you're probably thinking, what the heck is that? Um, so here is what the 8949 looks like um, and you can see here this is the front page of it so it's part one where short term is reported. Uh, the back page of it is part two for long term transactions and um, it looks really similar to this. You can see again that there are columns. There's a column for the description of the property, uh, you know, the date acquired, the date sold, the proceeds, the cost, um, so any codes that would um, cause an adjustment, the actual uh, number of the adjustment, and then the, the gain or the loss. Um, so you can see that the form really uh, fits the same columns as what we were having reported to us on the 1099B. And then once the transactions are totaled on the form 8949, they flow onto form schedule D uh, where we just have you know, a couple of columns for the proceeds and the cost. And here again, you can see we have a part one and a part two that divides out our short term capital gains and our long term capital gains. When we have a capital gain, of course, uh, we're going to have income that is going to be taxed at either the ordinary rate or the lower capital gains rate. Um, when we have a capital loss, uh, our taxpayers are allowed to take some of that, um, but not all of that. So when there is a loss, uh, we would take the proceeds minus the adjusted basis. We get a negative number, we get a loss. The taxpayer can only take $3,000 of that in the current year. So what happens when, um, when there is a loss that's bigger than that, 
uh, we'll take the calculated capital loss, we subtract the current year deduction, and they are left with what's called a capital loss carry forward. And this can be carried forward from year to year until it's used up. So in, in the next year, they would be able to claim another $3,000 in capital loss. Um, and, and the year after, if they had more carry forward, they would be able to keep carrying that forward and using it $3,000 at a time. And when we do a return that uh, has a capital loss that's going to result in a carry forward, there is a capital loss carry forward worksheet that is generated. And um, this is important for our taxpayers to be bringing in year to year. So uh, if they are having a carry forward, then we would encourage them to bring in uh, that tax return the next year so that um, whoever performs their tax preparation will will know to that they have this um, capital loss that they can apply to their to their taxes in future years. And it's also important to note that some of our taxpayers may already have some capital loss carry forward. And so we're uh, hoping that they're bringing that in. Um, and if they haven't brought it in, we might say, hey, could we reschedule so that you can bring that in so we can um, help you get your best benefits on your return. Aside from gains and losses uh, from the sale of stocks or mutual funds, we can also help report the sale of a home. And it's important to determine first whether this was the taxpayer's main home or whether it was not their main home. If it was their main home and they have a gain, then uh, some or all of that gain may be excluded from income. If it was a loss, it won't be deductible on a main home. And uh, they may or may not need to uh, report on Form 8949 and Schedule D. If this was not their main home, <clears throat> then this sale must be reported on uh, Form 8949 and Schedule D. Let's talk a little bit about situations where taxpayers have to report the sale of a home. So there's a couple of tests associated with, uh, with the um, sale of a main home. Uh, that's the ownership test and the use test. If the taxpayer does not meet those two tests, um, then we are going to be reporting the sale of, of the home on a on the return. Also, uh, if during the two year period ending on the date of the sale, the taxpayer had excluded gain from the sale of another home, we're going to be reporting the sale of this home. And uh, if the taxpayer has a gain and does not uh, qualify to exclude all of that gain, then the sale needs to be reported on the return. And the taxpayer may have a gain and choose not to exclude it, in which case we would definitely need to be reporting this sale. And then any time a taxpayer received Form 1099-S that was um, reported to the IRS or you know, a copy of that was sent to the IRS, uh, then we need to make sure that um, the sale of the home uh, appears on the return even if we make an adjustment to exclude any gains. And we need to talk about what a main home is, what it means. Uh, so a main home is where the taxpayer lives most of the time. And it doesn't have to be a traditional house. Uh, it could be a houseboat, a mobile home, a cooperative apartment or condominium. The, the requirements are that it must have a cooking, sleeping, and bathroom facilities in order for it to be considered a main home. And then uh, taxpayers who have more than one home, they don't get to uh, designate which home is their main home. It's going to be where they are living most of the time. And we brought up a little bit before about 
um, the exclusion of gain from a main from the sale of a main home and the two tests associated with that our ownership test and our use test so the ownership test says that the taxpayer needs to have owned the home for at least two years and the use test says that um, the taxpayer needs to have lived in the home as a main home for at least two of the last five years and I'm sure you can imagine that for our uh, married taxpayers, this might get a little more complicated. So in order to exclude the gain on the sale of a main home, uh, spouses must file a joint return. And in that case, it doesn't matter which spouse owns the, uh, the house, um, either one is fine but they both need to meet the use test. They both have to have used that home as a main home um, in at least two of the last five years. And um, neither of them can have excluded a gain um, from the sale of a home in the two years prior to the sale of this home. And um, if both are not meeting that use test, then it's possible that they will have uh, different calculations on the exclusion of gain, um, which is a much more complicated situation, and we're going to be sending these taxpayers to a paid professional. The amount of gain that can be excluded does have an upper limit, um, but remember that this is gain, so uh, this is not the sale price. This is the sale price minus the cost um, would be the gain. So for married filing joint taxpayers and certain surviving spouses, um, that exclusion amount can be up to $500,000. And for all others, the exclusion amount is uh, half of that at $250,000. And there is a worksheet that is um, available to help determine whether taxpayers can take the full exclusion amount or whether they can only take part of it. Um, it's important to note that if they're only able to take part of that, we will be sending them to a paid preparer. And calculating the gain on the sale of a home is real similar to the calculation for um, the gain on, on any property. Um, but there's a, one extra little component to it. Um, so we have the proceeds and we talked about that and we never adjust the proceeds. The proceeds are the proceeds. The, the sales price is the sales price. Um, and then we subtract out selling expenses. Um, and then we subtract out adjusted basis and come to our gain or loss. Um, if, if you remember just a few minutes ago when we were talking about um, you know, selling stock and if there were commissions and fees, then we would adjust the basis. In this case, um, the, the selling expenses are quite common with this, with this type of property and they, they get their own little bit of treatment. Proceeds on the sale of a home could be uh, money, which is very straightforward, right? But also, if the taxpayer had any notes or mortgages or other debt that was taken over by the buyer, um, that counts towards the proceeds of the sale. And then if there was any other property that was received um, in exchange for the sale of this, um, of this home, then that would also count towards the proceeds of this sale. So the fair market value of those other properties that were received by the taxpayer. And generally speaking, uh, the proceeds will be reported on the 1099-S. However, um, if our taxpayer qualifies for the exclusion, they may not have received a 1099-S. If they did receive the 1099-S, remember, we definitely need to get that uh, sale on, on the return, um, and then we can um, use some adjustments to uh, exclude the amount that they're allowed to exclude but it's possible that they didn't receive a 1099-S and, and then it does not need to be reported on the return. Other places that we might be getting uh, information about 
uh, the sale of this home, things like the proceeds and uh, the selling expenses and any adjustments to basis. Um, we might see a lot of these on the, um, the taxpayer's HUD-1. They probably received this uh, settlement statement when they sold their home. Um, so a lot of that information can be got off the HUD-1. Um, and they may have other records, especially for um, basis, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So if we were looking at the HUD-1 and all of the uh, items that are listed on there, aside from just the proceeds, how much they got from the sale, uh, there are a lot of selling expenses included on there. So the things that we would be looking for would be uh, commissions, like say to the real estate agent, um, advertising fees, legal fees, any mortgage points, not for, this, uh, not for the taxpayer's mortgage that they had, but if the buyer um, is taking out a mortgage and part of the agreement is that the seller is going to pay some of those points, um, if that's the case, that's considered a selling expense for the seller. And then any transfer taxes or cour courier fees, and there are more things that could be added to selling expenses, but those are the common ones. And then you may see some things that are not considered selling expenses. So these are things like prorated homeowners fees or property taxes, or interest on the loan that was the seller's loan prior to the uh, date of the sale. So, um, you know, our taxpayer may have had a mortgage on their home before they sold it. Any interest that they paid on that is not a selling expense. Um, some of these items could be uh, deductible as an itemized deduction, um, and some of them will not be deductible at all, and they're considered personal expenses. Um, but these are not selling expenses, even if they might be deductible somewhere else on the return. Now we can talk about what adjusted basis is for a home. So uh, whatever the cost was to the taxpayer is the original basis, right? Well, over the course of the time they owned that home, it's very likely that they made some improvements. Um, you know, maybe they had additions, they redid the bathroom, um, any, anything that they did to the home that uh, had a useful life of greater than a year, but um, it does not include, improvements don't include things that are um, regular to the maintenance of the home or, or any kind of repairs. It has to be something that, you know, improved it. So um, that adds to the basis. And then there are a few things that could um, subtract from the basis or make that cost lower. So if the taxpayer had taken uh, deductible casualty losses um, in a prior year, then um, that would subtract from their basis, from their cost. Um, or if they had uh, any previously postponed gains from a sale of a home, um, that might uh, subtract from their cost. And depreciation is another thing that would subtract from the cost. But it's important to note that um, any of these reductions in basis, those are out of scope. So for our taxpayers, we're really just looking at what was their cost? Did they have any um, large improvements that um, you know, had a useful life of greater than a year? Then we can make an adjustment to basis for that, but not the reductions, uh, the reductions we need to send them to a paid preparer. Speaking of scope issues, we do have quite a few scope issues uh, in regard to the sale of um, assets. So uh, taxpayers who have sold any assets other than stock, mutual funds, or a personal residence uh, need to be seen by a paid professional. Um, taxpayers who trade in options, futures, or other commodities um, and it doesn't matter whether they disposed of them during the year, uh, it's enough that they trade in them, uh, they also need to see a um, paid professional. Uh, taxpayers who answer yes to the virtual currency question, which is, you know, did you uh, sell, exchange, or um, own any virtual currency, then we would be sending them to a paid preparer as well. Um, 
Also, there's uh, like-kind exchanges where the taxpayer is receiving property in exchange for property they're giving up, and worthless securities, those are out of scope. Um, and then in regard to the sale of a home, um, any time that uh, taxpayers might need to be reducing that exclusion amount, um, or if we have married homeowners that don't meet all the requirements to claim the maximum exclusion, or if they had uh, use issues that weren't qualified, uh, we need to be sending them to a paid preparer as well. And then, of course, if the home was used at any time for business or as a rental property, uh, that would result in depreciation issues. And we've talked about before, we, we don't do depreciation uh, through VITA. So again, we would uh, tell our taxpayers that they uh, need to see a paid preparer for the year. Scope issues that are related specifically to basis are um, for any asset that was acquired uh, in another way other than by purchase or an inheritance. So it could be a gift or it could be like employee stock options unless the taxpayer is providing us the basis in the holding period. Um, we need to send those taxpayers on to a paid professional as well. Um, the basis of uh, an inherited property that was determined by a method other than the fair market value of the property on the date of the decedent's death. Um, again, unless the taxpayer is providing us the basis and the holding period. Um, if there were decreases in basis due to uh, deductible casualty losses uh, or gains uh, that the taxpayer postponed from the sale of a previous home, um, or a decrease in basis due to depreciation uh, during the time the home was uh, the home was used for business purposes or as a rental property. Um, these are all situations that Im involve complexities that are out of scope for the VITA program. And one last slide about scope issues, and these relate specifically to Form 1099B. So um, if we have amounts of accrued market discount, profit or loss uh, realized on closed contracts, unrealized profit or loss on open contracts from a prior year or from a current year, um, or aggregate profit or loss from contracts, um, proce proceeds uh, from collectibles, so again, those are property other than um, stocks or mutual funds, bartering, and if there is a foreign account um, filing requirement, uh, they call that FATCA. Then, um, and these are all boxes on the Form 1099-B. So if you're seeing those boxes with amounts in them, then we need to send our taxpayer to a paid professional to help them with those.